everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from the creativepen.com and this is J. Daniel Sawyer. Dan is a prolific science fiction and fantasy author, a podcaster, blogger, filmmaker and photographer. So welcome Dan. Howdy. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I've been listening to your stuff for ages and you know, you do so much with your time. So tell us a bit more about you and your writing, podcasting, etc. career so far. Um, <laughs> let's see, I'm the author of the Antithesis Progression series of uh, science fiction spy novels, the second of which I'm almost done writing. The first of which is called Predestination and Other Games of Chance and is available at my website, jdsawyer.net, and in ebook form and soon in print. Um, the second free will will be resuming the podcast uh, sometime in May once I've actually finished writing it. I attempted to write as I was podcasting. Don't do that. It's a very bad <laughs> idea. Um, I'm also the author of Down From Ten, which is a genre train wreck. Uh, it's a, <laughs> a murder mystery cabin fever comedy type affair. Um, and that also is available in podcast form and is coming out in paperback. I'm the author of the Clark Lantham Mysteries, which are available in paperback and ebook format. And several short stories, um, my podcasting, I do the Polysystematic Reprobates Hour, as well as my fiction stuff. I'm on Apologia, which is a McLaughlin group for religion, ethics, and philosophy. Uh, I do photography. The uh, poster, you see, oops, poster you see behind me here is an example of some of my photographic and design work. And I basically just get bored easily, so I do a lot of stuff. Yeah, you do. you do an amazing amount of stuff. And can I say... Your blog is one of the most intelligent around, I think. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I do. I, I, I think you do. You write some really long, intelligent posts, and I kind of read them and go, wow, that's very deep. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm currently blogging about my recent experiences car shopping. Oh, so there you go. It's entertaining as well as informative. <laughs> but, uh, Okay, so I particularly wanted to talk to you because you left a comment on my blog about your writing habits and your word count and um, how that has changed over the last year. Can you explain um, you know, a bit about what you, what you talked about there and how your word count has changed so much? Um, well, I used to be a much more sporadic writer. I would, um, you know, write as hard as I could as long as I felt inspired and then... Um, when I didn't feel inspired, I would tend to sit around and stare at the screen a lot, which can get quite boring and hard on the eyes. Um, sometime uh, last, I guess it was last June, I was um, trying to get back into writing fiction after several months of life being too busy to do it properly. And I uh, was, was having a lot of trouble, so I started writing a um, short story that turned into the first uh, Clark Lantham novel. Um, I had great momentum. I was writing it, and during the course of that, someone started uh, asking me a lot of questions about guns, which is something that a lot of author friends ask me about. I had the pleasure of tutoring Philippa Valentine at a range for, for one of her recent books. It was a lot of fun. And I realized that enough people have been asking me this that there might actually be a market for a book on it, so I went ahead and in the same month wrote a book on that. By the end of 50 days, I'd done 150,000 words. And I thought, I don't want to stop. I kind of like this. It's a lot easier with I'm doing it every day. So since then, I have been working on doing it every day. You know, the occasional week or so gets lost here and there because of taxes and illness and stuff like that. But in the last nine months, I've done about 350,000 words. And my lifetime word count is now up over upwards of one and a quarter million and it's a lot easier every day mm. and the quality of the work is actually a lot higher I have to do less revision when I'm working on it every day um, even to the point of fewer typos but definitely fewer continuity errors mm. and um, it has firmly won and, uh, writing is an art to writing is a craft the art part comes automatically when you're in the habit what I um, I've come to think that the uh, the art part of writing comes more dependably, more regularly, and uh, and the quality is higher writing every day, as if you're mowing the lawn or doing some other basic everyday thing, 
when it's part of the habit, it becomes a much better thing. Mm. And do you have a do you have an outline to write from then, um, or are you a discovery writer? I'm a little bit of halfway in between. I usually need to know where a book's going to end, and I will often keep um, notes four or five scenes ahead of where I'm at, so I make sure mm. to stay more or less on track. I do occasionally veer off, but generally, as long as I know where the end of the book is, I'll twist around until I get there. Mm. And I guess, um, I mean, you do lots of different things, lots of different jobs, I guess. For people who are going to be saying, well, I work, you know, I work full time and I have kids and, you know, what, how do you make that time? Um, it takes, on a slow day, it takes about two or three hours to write 2,000 words. 2,000 words a day, even if you, say, take out weekends. Mm -hmm. That's 400 odd thousand words a year, and depending on the no length of novel you're writing, that's anywhere from two to four novels a year mm -hmm. without really even working at it. That is amazing. So, yeah. So, yeah, if you don't have time for it, I don't have a lot of sympathy. I understand what not having time looks like, and you, you can always carve out an episode you know, where you would watch Doctor Who this week. You can write for that time. Yeah. No, very good point. Very good point. Okay, now um, also as as I'm interviewing you, you're actually uh, on your treadmill, which I think is fantastic. Yes. And I, this is this is a big thing for me. It's the how do we get our exercise when we're writing as well as doing everything else. So tell us about how you how you write on a treadmill. Well, I don't write fiction on a treadmill. I can't seem to get my brain to work that way. But I do like blog posts and outlining and and sometimes graphic design on the treadmill. Um, I've had a treadmill for years, and a couple of years ago, a friend of mine that works at Google was talking about the installed walking desks. I asked her to describe it as a desk on a treadmill. And I thought, well, I wonder if I could do that. So I slapped a, I cut a piece of plywood to shape, and I attached it to the desk, and I built a mount for the uh, laptop, and I got an external keyboard here. Um, external mouse, and uh, I walk while I'm doing stuff that doesn't require fiction out of me. Mm. It's uh, very easy to do two or three hours of strolling every day or whatnot, and it uh, feels good. Yeah, no, I think that's brilliant. And the whole standing desk idea is, is um, I mean, because I'm an IT consultant, I sit down all day and I come home and I sit down and do other stuff on the computer. So, um, yeah, I guess you had a broken keyboard there as well, didn't you? So did you get an ergonomic yes. advisor or something? Well, you know, I, uh, I did, uh, when I was on that writing binge that I was telling you about, I actually wound up with a really, really crippling carpal tunnel to the mm -hmm. point where I could really move my hands at all and I decided something had to change and the most obvious thing was the keyboard mm. um, my uh, partner has uh, severe carpal tunnel and so has had one of these keyboards for a long time and has been raving about it so I snuck into her room and stole it and uh, <laughs> wound up having to buy her a new one because it works so well yeah. so yeah this goes everywhere I have a little compartment in my laptop case the keyboard goes with me when I go out to write at coffee shops and whatnot. Mm. No, I think that that's great. And I, because I do, I get, uh, you know, RSI in my hand and I, I now am ambimaustrous. So, you know, I can use my mouse with either hand. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think we all have to do things to protect our bodies, don't we, as we write? Oh, yeah. yeah you wouldn't think it, but you can actually ruin your body writing. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with not getting enough exercise so that you gain weight. That happen to all of us. Mm. It has to do with the, the repetitive stress injuries that you get in your arms and elbows and in your neck. Um, those will kill you. They're just really, really nasty. And the pain from them will stop you being able to think well enough to write. Mm. No, definitely. Okay, another thing I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, I find out these snippets from you of, you know, your writing life. Um, you have a writing partner in um, Gail Carragher, who's the author of the Parasol yes. Protectorate books. So tell me about that. How do you guys work together with your writing? Um, we have a couple of coffee shops that we bounce between, one on her side of the Delta, one on mine. Um, every Tuesday morning we meet at, we 
go, we sit down, we gossip and catch up for about 15, 20 minutes, sometimes an hour, and then we've got three hours where we sit and write or edit or whatever we're working on. Um, if we're having trouble, if one or the other of us is having trouble uh, getting our word count out, we'll do races and mutual ridicule, and we're very competitive. It works very well. And uh, it's a good it's a good touchstone every Tuesday. You don't want to spend a whole week and then go and say, oh, I didn't write at all this week. That's why I'm glad I'm here. Because that's, that's embarrassing when the other person is turning out several books. And we've both been on other, either end of that from time to time. So it's a good spur to keep going. It's, uh, there's something very grounding about talking to another writer who's doing this or attempting to do this for a living every week. You share industry news. You talk about what the new projects are. It makes what you're doing feel real instead of like the aberrant deviant activity it truly is. So. Mm. And how did you how did you guys connect? How did you find each other? Oh, we've known e we've known each other since before uh, she sold the Par in fact I think since before she wrote the Parasol Protectorate. Um, when uh, when she sold it I was quite happy for her and at the time I don't think she knew that I wrote and I vaguely knew that she wrote, so at that point we started talking shop. And um, yeah, but we've been we've known each other four or five years now. Hmm. And what, what advice would you give to other people? Okay, so I'm thinking about me particularly. I'm going to be moving to a new city, and I, I, I've listened to you, and I actually think that having a writing partner would be a great idea. So how would I go about finding someone? Um, well, my first uh, writing partner that I was uh, working with very frequently before Gail, I actually met at a convention. Mm -hmm. uh, was sitting next to her in the uh, in a religion and philosophy debate, and she obviously disagreed absolutely one hundred percent with everything that I thought. But she was very civil and articulate about it. And so afterwards, I turned and handed handed her my card, and I say, "I don't agree with you on a single thing, and I think it's fabulous. Give me a call." <laughs> <laughs> and we started uh, we started talking, and we were both in the market for a writing buddy at the time. So we started, and that was a little more of a of a mutual beta reader type relationship. But mm -hmm. uh, that worked out very well too. So anywhere you can find a writer that uh, you get along with, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you you shouldn't have any trouble. You talk shop with everybody. So <laughs> <laughs> that that's true. Um, but um, I guess, you know, so do you actually just sit down and you said you had a chat and then you actually write um, together. So do you have like a word count weekly or do you set goals? Well, we each have uh, the daily word count that we're trying to get every day. Um, I'm, am, I'm rather ambitious. I'm trying to push up to about 5,000 a day. I was doing 4,000 a day at the beginning of the year and then it was a very busy winter. So I'm down to more like 2,000. Mm -hmm. um, she does 2,000 a day and doesn't care to really push beyond that because it's a good maintainable pace for her. Mm -hmm. So we each set our own goals and then if we don't make them, we ridicule each other for it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what we all need is someone to be accountable to. I think that's, that's the basics really, isn't it? It's that accountability. Uh, or, or just the, uh, the fellowship. The, you know, you're, you're with another pro who's acting like a pro and expecting you to. It's very good. Mm. Right, so I also wanted to ask you about the podcasting, because you've been podcasting a while, you know, you've got the nice mic there, you know, you do it in a very professional manner. So what has podcasting meant for you as a fiction writer? Um, showed me that I had an audience. Before that, I didn't really think I did, because I tend to write things that blends genres. And um, I started trying to sell in an era of market contraction. So I didn't really know if what I was writing was worth all the trouble it was causing me. Mm. Um, I acquired an audience very, very quickly and uh, showed me that there is an audience out there for my work. Um, and that was about all the excuse I needed to uh, start writing quite seriously. Um, it's also uh, my probably my favorite art form is radio drama. And so I do full cast. I've got a composer that uh, composes original scores for all my stuff. And so I basically get to write a book and make a radio drama at the same time. It's fabulous. <laughs> so in, on the personal gratification scale, it's way up there. So, that, so then you do it for the creative you know, process, I guess. 
yeah, it uh, it's it's fun, and I, you know the next few that I podcast are going to be available for pay in audiobook form long before they ever hit the feed. Mm. I'm, I'm working ahead so that by probably about September I'll be in a position where when I want to podcast a book I'm picking something from the shelf of commercially available titles rather than trying to do the production every week because I'll be doing production all the time anyway working on stuff to stock the to stock the store. Mm. Um, and um, I guess in terms of podcasting is it is it worth it for people who only want to do it to try and market their book or is it really only a labor of love? Um, I don't necessarily think it's either. I mean, it can be a great labor of love. I think if, uh, oh, it's real. I have a really hard time answering this question because the politics in the field are rife. Mm. Um, there are those that want to give everything away for free. And there are those whom have figured out, who have figured out how to do that and do very well at it. Scott Sigler is one of them. Mm absolutely fabulous at uh, building his tribe and having his tribe pay him back for everything he's given to them. The problem is that very easily becomes, um, you can very easily develop a sense that you are owed by your audience when you've been giving stuff away. And that breaks the implicit contract. Um, It can develop into an ego thing and that's not healthy for a career as a writer. Um, As a marketing thing, you know, five, ten years ago, it was a really good idea. Now, audiobooks and ebooks are verging on getting bigger than print books, so mm-hmm. you're essentially giving away a big slice of your market. <laughs> so, it's not necessarily a great idea if you're just podcasting stuff that you're trying to sell the print version of. Um, and if that's all you've got, that's one of the reasons I'm working ahead so that there will always be more available for sale than I've ever given away for free because there's only so many weeks in the year we can can drop an episode. Um, It is an excellent audience recruitment tool. Mm. Um, And I I think that's about where I am with it. It's great for audience recruitment and for staying in touch with an audience and keeping your core group of fans excited and active and fed with your content. Um, I don't know if this is a coherent answer, but that's about what I've got. Feel free to ask follow-ups. Yeah. Well, no, I, I, I like doing my podcast. I mean, I do an interview podcast, you know, like, like this, <laughs> um, which is right. different because it's about learning stuff. But also when people hear your voice every week and people have been listening to your voice for a, a long time, that does build a relationship, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, it does. And uh, I, get, I get notes from people all the time going, when's the new stuff coming? I miss hearing you every day on my commute. It's a wonderful thing to hear. It's like, oh, I've got to finish the book, I've got to finish the book. But, um, yeah, it's it's very good for building the uh, the, the core group of your audience. This um, You read, I'm sure, The Tipping Point. Glad mm. The Tipping Point. Yeah. It talks about the mavens, the ones who make or break any movement centered around something. Podcasting is definitely a um, treat for the mavens. Mm. Um, his terminology mm. no absolutely and I, I really enjoy it I'm kind of considering doing a one of one podcast episode of the first few chapters of my novel just to give people a taste and but, but probably not do the whole thing because it's such a production isn't it to do it well it depends on how you do it a single read as long as you know what you're doing it's very very quick it takes a little while to to figure out all the ins and outs but doing it the way I do it yeah it's, it's pretty time intensive mm. and I wouldn't recommend it to someone who wasn't already uh, neck deep in audio production anyway which I have been for the last 10 years so mm. right so you've, you've been telling us a bit you know how your books are all cross genre and all, all kinds of things so tell us about um, you know your, your latest book I guess and what people could expect if they if they had a read Oh, the uh, the Lantham books? Yeah. Uh, oh. Well, there's actually two of them now. The first one is called And Then She Was Gone. It's a uh, set over the course of 72 hours in the San Francisco Bay Area. The, uh, the hard-boiled detective is uh, Clark Lantham is hired by a soccer mom who's got a missing daughter, which means he has to go into the place he considers to be hell, uh, mm-hmm. suburbia. 
and uh, look for her. <laughs> and because this is the San Francisco Bay Area, the trail winds up leading through the kink scene, through the biopunk scene, to Stanford, out onto the uh, out onto the coast, all the little micro communities, and microcultures around the Bay Area. And it's a very quick, very funny, and mm -hmm. uh, rather dark and intense chase mystery. Um, as the uh, as he gets not too far in, he realizes the clock is ticking on this girl's life, and he has to find her so that she doesn't get killed. Um, along the way, he gets framed for murder, and a lot of other um, really interesting and bizarre things happen. Uh, book two is The Ghostly Christmas Present, where Lantham finds himself stranded by a snowstorm in Seattle and so has to actually spend Christmas with his family, which is another one of Lantham's favorite hells. Um, during the course of the uh, Christmas festivities, his brother gets murdered by a ghost in full view of everybody. And he has to figure out how it's done and who did it. And uh, that one deals uh, less with the uh, biotech and fringe sciencey stuff that, uh, that uh, and then she was gone does and more with the, uh, the underpinnings of the recent mortgage crisis. I worked a lot of that kind of stuff in. Mm. Uh, the next book in the series is due out uh, September. It's called Silent Victor, and it's about a security guard who is struck dumb when aliens uh, stage a heist on a local science museum. <laughs> He's the only witness, and as far as the security cameras can tell, it really was an alien invasion. He actually saw what happened, but it is so bizarre and horrific that he's suffering severe aphasia and can't communicate what happened. Meanwhile, there are moon rocks missing and all sorts of other stuff going on that could threaten the uh, stability of NASA and a few other organizations in the Bay Area. <laughs> That's brilliant. You, I do love this kind of going all over the shop sort of genre idea. It's it's marvelous. And wh where do you get? You know, it's a terrible writer's question, but where do you get your ideas from? <laughs> okay, let me re let me rephrase it. What are your <laughs> Shush. <laughs> what are your inspirations? And, you know, like I, I find um, inspiration in religion and psychology, that type of thing. What are your inspirations? Um, oh, boy. The, that's still not a good question. I, I'm very much, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a heavy duty polymath in my interests. So mm. um, religion and psychology are fascinating. Uh, neurological, um, neurological stuff really fascinates me. I'm very much into the um, into the emerging fields of genomics and biotech, and I'm, and I'm right in the right part of the world for all this stuff to come together and collide off each other. Um, literally five miles up the road is the company that that developed organ printers, mm -hmm. where they print out a human organ on an inkjet printer that they can then transplant into somebody. Um, I've got NASA 40 miles down the road. I've got a friend who works there. One of my voice actors from Predestination works there. Um, it's a really good place to be continually subjected to all sorts of things that would make great stories. And I also hang out with people like Gail Carriger and like my partner Kitty Nakian and you know, people with very niche, unusual interests that are always good for idea and I just keep keep things sort of juggling in my head all the time and occasionally two or three different elements will collide off each other and there's an obvious story to be told. Mm. No, that's great. It's, just, it, it's keeping the pot boil, you know, boiling all the time like a stock pot. Mm. Well when you're writing so many words you need a constant flow of ideas. Well it keeps it fun. <laughs> you know, and, and what's the point if it's not fun, right? Absolutely. Right, well, where can people find you and your books and your podcasts? You can find me and everything you need to know about me and probably more than you ever want to at www.jdsawyer.net. Fantastic. Well, thanks ever so much for your time, Dan. That was great. Welcome. Thank you.